Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I don't know if um, there is any sincerity in the knocking of the table by my colleagues because I can hear them whispering, Chelsea, Chelsea, Mr. Speaker. Um, and Mr. Speaker, I hear them asking about the high five. And it's unfortunate, rather unfortunate, Mr. Speaker, that most members of the cabinet are gunners or supporters of the gunners and I have bad news for them that the gunners will be just like Chelsea at the end of the season with absolutely no silverware. Anyways, Mr. Speaker, I stand before you here today acknowledging a higher power. He guides my steps, he inspires my purpose, and he grants me and he grants me the privilege of serving the people of Mikud North in this esteemed house. Mr. Speaker, understanding our place in this world is paramount. Each day, my conviction strengthens. God, not man, God, Mr. Speaker, entrusted me to be the voice of the people of Mikud North. Similarly, Similarly, with unwavering faith, I recognize Prime Minister Philip Joseph Pierre's divinely ordained rule, much like those of us who know Queen Esther in the Bible. He was a man for a time like this, Mr. Speaker. And as we approach year three, a shadow seems to lengthen. The forces of negativity disguise, disguise as people, disguise as circumstances and they intensify their assault. Lies, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Lies, Mr. Speaker. Slander and deceit aim to paint a bleak picture of St. Lucia. But I find solace, Mr. Speaker, in the story of Joseph in Genesis 50:20, And this verse reads, and I want my colleagues to find solace in this verse as well, Mr. Speaker. What they intended for evil against me, God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. And this is very apt, Mr. Speaker, because what we see happening now, especially from members who we expect better from, Mr. Speaker, try to go out there and spread lies and deceit to try to tarnish the name of St. Lucia and St. Lucians, and then they claim that they love St. Lucians and they want to represent St. Lucians, Mr. Speaker. But I can tell you that what they intend for evil, Mr. Speaker, God will turn and use for good. God's grace has touched me. God's grace has touched this administration. And it has touched my esteemed colleagues. Let us not be swayed by evildoers. Trust in the Lord. Do good, and he will see you through. Commit your way to him and he will act. However, Mr. Speaker, doubt lingers. The current opposition consumed, and sometimes when I see the current opposition, I want to have, I want to kind of take away the member from Chozel, Mr. Why? Speaker. I want to kind of take away the member from Chozel. I have, I, have I have a soft, I have a soft point. Yes, we have a good relationship, Mr. Speaker. But the current opposition com consumed by ambition for power, Mr. Speaker, relentlessly tarnishes our nation's reputation. Their hunger, it knows no bounds. And their accomplices, those we hold in higher regard, are a source of grave disappointment. They sow discord, striving to chase away investors and try to destabilize Mikud North and St. Lucia by extension. But you know what I tell them, Mr. Speaker? Their efforts, it's akin to cultivating a male marijuana plant. And if you know what a male marijuana plant does, Mr. Speaker, it flourishes. Yes, it remains barren. The attempt to chaos will yield something. And I choose to focus on our present market. Every day, Mr. Speaker, that Odia Meka Adubut is here, Nadubut Akai Parliament, Akai. 
seulement because of moon qui mouté descend avec i vote à dire but mais parce que bon dieu ban moi opportunité bon dieu choisi moi qui ban moi opportunité pour moi ça parler by Jamico pour moi ça représenter Jamico et puis pour moi ça fait travail là dans Jamico ca mandé moi pour faire ba yo mais nous n'y a problème monsieur speaker nous n'a problème que la ni moun en opposition nous expect plus mer from you nous expect you pour plus ni plus intelligence nous ex, expect you pour moucher à cette level maturity monsieur speaker et puis nous expect you pour ni principe et puis ça nous ha we from ces moun ça qui ça ca dit ça yo dit et ça yo fait c'est des fois bagaille l'ove ça yo ka fait c'est yo ka aller aller l'autre pays mal parler cette ici mal pas dit moun qui veut am investir cette ici dit yo dat cette ici pas bon bon côté pour invest toute qualité mal porté ni pour dire about cette ici c'est moun ça là ka dit dat yo veut venir représenter juste cette ici yo mêlé about juste cette ici et puis moi Save that the moon sala pasa. Jamie mele about city city because so mele about a moon. It's not going to be treated you, Mr. Speaker. Anyways, Mr. Speaker, I'm going to move to the pressing matters. The people of Mikunov, and I see I have one of my constituents here with me this morning, Miss Magdalene, and I say thank you for coming. The people of Mikunov, my unwavering supporters, have my deepest gratitude. I say thank you for trusting me to represent your voices. Thank you for trusting me to represent your interests. Your love and your unwavering support fuel my dedication. To my family, the unwavering pillars of my strength, I extend my deepest appreciation. Gratitude also to the Prime Minister and my colleagues for ensuring that Mikwood's North needs are met. Finally, Mr. Speaker, I want to say heartfelt condolences to the Stephen family on the passing of Dean. Dale Stephen, Monipo, and the cricket community, and the entire sporting fraternity, Mr. Speaker, we have suffered a great loss. And my deepest sympathy to Miss Fina as well of Monjab and Miss Sharon James, who both lost young men who met their demise, Mr. Speaker, in a very unfortunate way. Now turning our attention to the matter of the 2024-2025 appropriation bill. As His Excellency the Acting Governor General, Mr. Cyril Earl Charles, aptly stated, we have good reason to celebrate and to be proud. The Prime Minister's theme for this year's budget, building our infrastructure for a resilient economy, is indeed a cause for celebration and pride for us parliamentarians and the people of St. Lucia. This pride stems, Mr. Speaker, not only from the promise of vital infrastructural development, but also from the Prime Minister's prudent leadership. We acknowledge the two-year wait for this focus on infrastructure. However, we also recognize that the Prime Minister prioritizes responsible financial management. Unlike the former Prime Minister, he will not burden the future with excessive debt as evidenced by his commitment to reducing outstanding DFC loans, which he inherited in excess of $160 million. This dedication, Mr. Speaker, to fiscal responsibility is further exemplified by the Prime Minister's patient approach. He has not yielded to immediate pressures, including some from us within this chamber, Mr. Speaker. He understands, as a strong leader that he is, that infrastructure investments must occur at the right time when the country can truly afford them. This cautious approach has demonstrably paid off. The Prime Minister he has skillfully managed public finances, creating the necessary fiscal space for the initiatives outlined in the 2024-2025 Appropriation Bill. He strategically waited, Mr. Speaker, until local payables to suppliers were reduced by a significant $70 million from $154 million to $84 million. Additionally, he ensured the complete settlement of outstanding contributions and lease payments to the National Insurance Corporation. Furthermore, Mr. Speaker, 
The Prime Minister waited for a period of improvement in the labour market. We are now experiencing an un unemployment rate of just 14%, the lowest in a very long time, with youth unemployment decreasing for remarkably three consecutive years. These positive economic indicators demonstrate the effectiveness of the Prime Minister's leadership. Therefore, we, the parliamentarians, continue to place our trust in him and his strategic timing. The bill, the 2024-2025 appropriation bill, reflects the culmination of the Prime Minister's responsible financial management and his commitment to building a resilient solution for the future. I am delighted that the Prime Minister addressed infrastructure's broader scope, encompassing housing, healthcare, education, agriculture, security, and economic development. Because I can tell you, the year of infrastructure theme. The budget offers something for everyone. The minimum wage our commitment to the dignity of all $1,500 payment grant to each of the 93 private early childhood centers demonstrates this government's responsiveness. The Prime Minister's swift action on the banana box shortage, and you heard the Minister for Agriculture spoke to that. This is particularly noteworthy. The allocation in this budget to assist affected farmers exemplifies government's attentiveness. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, at your bag, I had the day, I observed the BJ Sala, the appropriation bill, the Premier Minister, Pali. Madi, I observe that the leader BJ Salah is not a guy by two people. The leader is not a guy that, even if we talk about it, we need to have a lot of infrastructure. We know that we need to have a lot of infrastructure. We have 2013 schools. We have a preschool. We have a lot of money. 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 Et puis, le ministre agricole parle de sa plus bonne côté Pharma Fig, pas tenu boîte pour yoter ça, mettez Fig. Et puis, chaque Pharma a tenu la situation pour Fig, il a gâté. Et puis, un micro, et je ne parle pas pour Denry Nord qui parle de ça aussi, parce que je crois que nous sommes déjà des gens qui sont les plus affectés par la situation. Et puis, nous sommes en situation où, même si ça fait juste l'autre jour, le Premier ministre a dit que c'est un bagage que nous n'avons pas besoin d'attention. Et puis, nous avons besoin de ces femmes d'assistants. Nous avons besoin de 500 000 dollars. 500 000 dollars pour les deux budgets. Pour les femmes de ces gens qui perdent des figures. Parce que ces femmes qui travaillent, elles ont contribué. Et puis, elles ont payé des taxes pour tout le monde. Et puis, mais pas que ça qui arrive. C'est fort. Et puis, je voulais applaudir le Premier ministre pour qu'il y ait nécessité nécessaire pour bailler ces femmes à anti-assistance, pour aider vous. Um, parce que vous avez de chaque fille, vous avez de l'argent, vous avez une famille pour préquer. Je suis que les public servants sont le backbone de notre nation. Recognizing the challenges some face in obtaining mortgages, the Prime Minister has established a 100% residential mortgage program for public servants. Leveraging the U.S. $20 million credit line from the Republic of China on Taiwan Exim Bank, managed by the St. Lucia Development Bank. Additionally, every successful applicant will receive a $1,000 contribution towards legal fees. And I think this is commendable, Mr. Speaker, because we all know the difficulties that public servants have when trying to access mortgages. And to be able to put a facility like that in place for them, it speaks to where the heart of the Prime Minister is. And he understands the plight of the people. He places himself in their shoes. And what he does, he responds to their needs. And he puts the necessary 
arrangements, necessary facilities so that they now can access and we can see a boost as it relates to public servants gaining access to mortgages. Incentives for, sustainable, for sustainability and seniors, Mr. Speaker. This budget promotes sustainability by reducing import duty to just 5% for people importing hybrid vehicles to St. Lucia. And our seniors, Mr. Speaker, are very important. They are not forgotten either. And they have never been forgotten. I think everybody here can agree with me that every time we come to this house for a budget, that there is something in there for pensioners and for seniors. Our Prime Minister takes his responsibility to our senior um, group of individuals in this country seriously, and he has always ensured that in everything that is indicated for our seniors. And our seniors, some government pensioners receive, as we speak, Mr. Speaker, pensions as low as $300. And effective August 1st, no government pensioner will receive less than $725. No NIC pensioner, Mr. Speaker, will receive less than $500 monthly. Have they did that? Lani Moon, a prison, you can join $300 per mois. And then, the people who have been working for a year, and the people who have been working for a year, and the people who have been working for a year, and the people who have been working for a year. Les nous garder 300 dollars. Expressement d'un temps, les nous voir pour la commission a aussi, pour tout bagaille a aussi. On ne peut pas dire qui manière à mon ça vivre et puis 300 dollars. Et puis le Premier ministre là, ouais, c'est nécessaire, nécessaire pour changer la situation ça. Et puis ça, il a fait, il dit que le 1er août, nous allons ouais, voir ça, nous allons créer un minimum wage. Ça a plus de l'âge à tout le monde qui travaille pour cette liste. Et puis, après, il y a des gens qui jouent 300 dollars. Et puis, il y a des gens qui jouent 1er août. Il y a des pièces pour cette liste qui jouent un pension du gouvernement qui jouent un yen en bas 725 dollars. Et puis, pièces pour les gens qui jouent un pension du NIC qui jouent un yen en bas 600 dollars. What a fantastic time to be a solution. The tax amnesty program continuation and the waiving of stamp duties on mortgages up to $400,000 for residential construction or renovations further incentivize growth. Mr. Speaker, I now turn to two crucial areas under my book. Crime prevention and people with disabilities. Mr. Speaker, both require sensitive and decisive action. I want to begin with people with disabilities. But I want to start by defining disabilities, Mr. Speaker. And understanding disability is paramount. Since taking office, Mr. Speaker, the reason I want to start by defining disability is because since assuming the office in, within the office of the Prime Minister with responsibility for persons with disabilities, I have received several phone calls, Mr. Speaker from individuals with broken limbs or sometimes limps and they believe that they qualify as a person with a disability. But according to the United Nations, a person with a disability is one who has a long-term, Mr. Speaker, long-term physical, mental, intellectual or sensory impairment which in interaction with various barriers hinders their full participation in society. And we have over 1 billion or about 15% of the global population who have disabilities and advancements in technology, in medicine, and aging populations indicate that this number will rise. The World Health Organization and the World Bank report that people with disabilities have poorer health outcomes, they have lower education achievements, and less economic participation. Prime Minister Philip J. Pierre recognized the need for a disability portfolio. Grateful, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity to champion their cause. <laughs> this is a giant. <laughs> When you look at our progress, Mr. Speaker, St. Lucia ratified the United Nations Conventions on the Rights of Persons with Disability in June 2020. And what this does, it safeguards 
and affirm the human rights of persons with disabilities. However, we need to look at the path forward. And as a state party to the convention, we must enact disability-specific legislation to effectively promote and protect their rights. I have been in dialogue, Mr. Speaker, with persons from the National Councils of and for Persons with Disabilities, and I am convinced that the time is now. The time is right, Mr. Speaker, for a St. Lucia Disabilities and Equal Opportunities Act. I am convinced that the time is now, Mr. Speaker. And me being in this current position, Mr. Speaker, is just testament that the time cannot be tomorrow. It has to be now. And collaboration is key in all that we do. And with the Prime Minister's support and with his endorsement, my ministry will lead the effort collaborating with disability organizations and the AG chambers to create our first comprehensive legal instrument for promoting and protecting disability rights. While we wait, while we wait for the go-ahead, Mr. Speaker, this government has engaged a consultant, and you heard the member for Castries South East. We have engaged a consultant to develop a national policy for persons with disabilities alongside with the National Council of and for Persons with Disability. And that's why I thank the member earlier, because he has beheaded this implementation with consultation starting last month. And we want to thank the Taiwanese and the Taiwanese ambassador for the grant to enable this policy's development. But beyond legislation, we need to see improved services. And this government prioritizes easy access to government services for persons with disabilities. The Office of the Prime Minister has been diligently working on a specific public service policy for the improvement of customer service for persons with disabilities and older persons. This comprehensive policy addresses providing accessible information, parking spaces, ramps, washrooms, and train personnel to assist customers with various impairments. It embodies our commitment to putting people first. And Mr. Speaker, as I speak about this comprehensive policy, this morning and I think sometime last week, and that's why I said I think the time to work on this piece of legislation is now, so that we can actually cause for the enactment and for the execution of the policy. Because this morning, Mr. Speaker, um, and I think sometimes, sometimes, Mr. Speaker, or most times, more often than not, I drive myself. I drive myself to Parliament, I drive myself to my constituency, to the supermarket, and everywhere that I go, Mr. Speaker. More often than not, I find myself driving myself. But the problem I have, Mr. Speaker, is when we get to institutions, or we get to buildings, Mr. Speaker, where especially institutions where the public are expected to access on a daily basis. We need to do better as a people, as a government, as a nation, to ensure that we make the necessary arrangements as it relates to accommodation for persons with disabilities. So, Speaker, I know and I can speak um, from a factual standpoint because during my time with you as Deputy Speaker and with our engagement with the Department of Infrastructure, I know that in the plans for the Parliament, um, there will be accommodation will be made for persons with disabilities. But that is something that has to be spread throughout the rest of the... Even when you go for a passport now, Mr. Speaker, I can tell you it can become... Sometimes we have quite a few buildings that are not disability friendly. And you have to go up five, six flights, maybe one, two, three, four, five flights of stairs, Mr. Speaker. I don't even like to say that word five now because members watch me when I say five. But no, five goals. Um, but Mr. Speaker, I think the time is now and the time is opportune for us to look at from building codes and that the member for Castries North is here, I think. The time is now, Mr. Speaker, for us to try to get things like building codes enacted because it cannot be that individuals are disadvantaged and they are unable to access public areas, Mr. Speaker, because the necessary arrangements have not been made. We have to also encourage and work towards the economic empowerment 
of persons with disability. And I know that the Ministry of Commerce, and I have to commend them, have implemented the MSME Loan Grant Facility, a $10 million initiative providing post-pandemic relief to micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises. And this program offers, I think, 70% um, grant, 30% loan at a low 3% interest rate with no collateral requirements. And when you hear these things, you know people get excited. But what is more, even more interesting about that, Mr. Speaker, is that they were considerate enough to ensure <coughs> that there were special provisions for persons with disabilities. And I want to commend um, the Ministry of Commerce for ensuring that they, there were special provisions for persons with disabilities. But I also want to encourage other agencies, like the Youth Economy Agency, to make a deliberate effort to cater for persons with disabilities, as they can play a very integral role in the economic viability of this beautiful nation. Mr. Speaker, every people with disabilities deserve the same opportunities to enjoy social events as everyone else. They deserve the same. They want to free up too, Mr. Speaker. They want to zest. They want to watch people on the bum bum wall like everybody else, Mr. Speaker. They want to do that too. <laughs> and we encourage, Mr. Speaker, the installation of wheelchair ramps and designated trained volunteers to assist persons with disabilities. And it is to this end, Mr. Speaker, that I want Hansa to capture my congratulations to the organizers of the Moshi Jazz. I want to say, I want to say bravo, bravo to Arthur, Royston Taylor, and the team of organizers from Moshi Jazz. And this is, and the Moshi vendors, Mr. Speaker, and this is a step in the right direction. And I want to encourage the Minister for Tourism, Culture, to adopt this same approach, Mr. Speaker, and this is something that we have to give serious consideration moving forward. Because I know individuals who would love to attend jazz. They want to attend carnival activities. And I know that it may come at an extra dollar, but they are worth it, Mr. Speaker. They are worth the investment. And I see, and you heard Sean said Tristan would love to attend jazz. Tristan was the recipient of the um, motorized wheelchair. I want to thank the Minister of Education and his team. And all of us have a part to play, but I want to say to the Minister of, of Jazz and Arts, Creative <laughs> Culture, I want to say to him that we should make a special attempt, Mr. Speaker, we should make a, a special attempt to ensure that persons with disabilities are able to access these events. <laughs> As I'm speaking to the Minister of Tourism, Mr. Speaker, I want to tell him that there is a very nice market, tourists with disabilities market. And we have a beautiful island. Year after year, we continue to capture prizes for tourism on the global stage. There is a real market for tourists with disabilities. And believe me, Mr. Speaker, they have money. They have money. No, not me. <laughs> I said tourist. No. One, there is a market that is worth billions annually. And it is high time that we started thinking of expanding our market to tap into this very lucrative market. Accessibility is crucial to our tourism dependent nation. Many destinations fail to capitalize on this potential due to lack of accessibility. And this lack of access costs destinations like ours millions. I plan to work closely with the Minister of Tourism and Infrastructure to ensure that St. Lucia is a competitive and attractive destination for disabled tourists, particularly regarding our major attractions. Think about it, Mr. Speaker. Let's think about the Sulphur Spring. For example, our history boasts of the therapeutic benefits of the Sulphur Springs. All of us know, uh, for one reason or the other, we go to the Sulphur Spring for a bath. C'est mon cadeau, ce n'est pas problème, mon chagrin, il prend un bain souffle. Ou quand il m'a ou, il prend un bain souffle. Tout problème, mon avec raison, il y a un cadeau, ça, sous malade, il prend un bain souffle. Il y a des souffles, il prend un bain souffle. 
but we know of the therapeutic benefits of the sulfur spring. And we all hold various beliefs about the healing properties. But there's no reason, there's no reason why, Mr. Speaker, that someone in a wheelchair or with mobility impairments shouldn't be able to experience it. There's no reason why. And in the near future, I encourage the Minister of Tourism and maybe the Sufre Regional Development Foundation to consider installing ramps or convenient lifting device at the Sulphur Springs so people with physical impairments can enjoy this refreshing bath in the world's only driving volcano. This will undoubtedly, and I say to the member for Sufre, this will undoubtedly enhance its appeal and boost the tourism revenue. So, encourage the Mounesard Fleur to put a ramp là. Well, ça bon, because si you put ça là, qu'on nous a sauvé, au café, au café là, au puy, au café là, Mounesard Fleur puy, et puis ça, ça qu'il fait, il qu'il s'abaisse moun qui ni disability opportunity pour ça vini en soufflant. Yo ka sa vini en soufflant contre tout l'autre monde. Yo ka sa vini dépenser l'argent yo en soufflant. Et yo ka vini wè sa soufflant ka bay, sa soufflant ka fè. Et la ni opportunité ba ou ek je souffrier pour ça fait plus l'argent sur ça fait soufflant à dans manière la plus monde ça accès li. The speaker we have to focus on training and employment. One of the key pillars of this vision is training and employment. We have to invest in programs that equip individuals with disabilities with the skills and knowledge they need to secure fulfilling careers. These include supporting vocational training programs that cater to the diverse disabilities, providing targeted skills development, partnering with businesses, and that's very important, partnering with businesses to promote inclusive hiring practices and offer necessary workplace accommodations. And Mr. Speaker, we have a situation, and that's why I say it has to be, I look forward to the, the national disability policy because one of the reasons, one of the hindrances, one of the deterrents why a lot of business um, entities do not hire persons with disabilities is because they do not have the necessary infrastructure to accommodate these individuals. But if we have a situation where we enact building codes to ensure that all buildings are accessible, what it does, it gives persons with a disability a greater chance and then employers are more likely now to employ persons with disabilities since their buildings would become accessible. We have to enact fair and effective minimum quota legislation that encourages businesses to hire qualified individuals with disabilities. And we also have to empower for education. Education is a cornerstone of opportunity and we have to ensure that our education system is fully accessible and inclusive. And this includes investing in accessible learning technologies such as screen readers and assistive software, providing specialized training for educators to support students with diverse needs, and offering, a university, offering university scholarships specifically for outstanding students with disabilities, fostering their academic excellence. We also, Mr. Speaker, have to celebrate the achievements and expand the support system. People with disabilities process, they possess, sorry, incredible talent and resilience. And we have to celebrate their achievements through special events like the Special Olympics, Mr. Speaker, and the Paralympics, showcasing their athleticism and their determination. Furthermore, we recognize the need for ongoing support. Providing financial relief to alleviate the financial burden of disability, ensuring basic needs are met. And I know that through the public assistance program that there's a component that deals with disability. And Mr. Speaker, I'm hoping that um, I'm due to have a conversation with the consultant very soon. And I'm hoping that part of the things that they captured is a review of the amount that is paid to persons with disability. Because disability goes beyond just the individual. It affects family members, Mr. Speaker. And we have instances where, because we do not have um, the appropriate accommodation for persons with disabilities. Parents are forced to stay home to provide and to care and nurture for their children with disabilities. So now it's not just the uh, a child with a disability. A parent is unable to go to work. 
a parent has to stay home and sometimes these disabilities are so unique that only the parents can provide the type of care that the child or that the person with this disability may require. And we need, <clears throat> I know that this is something that we do, I think up to last week, the Minister of Health would have ensured that we facilitate duty-free concession for persons with disabilities. And we have to reduce the costs associated with essential equipment and assistive technologies. To ensure effective support reaches those who need it most, we are committed to working with established agencies like the, and we need to work to ensure, Mr. Speaker, that we have an established national disability registry. I think that is something that is lacking and we have to work on. And what this will do, it will provide us with the data that we require to tailor our programs and services more effectively. We need to also provide government subventions, or I should say a little more, Mr. Speaker, to the disability organizations. These organizations are critical partners playing a vital role in advocacy and support services for persons with disabilities. And I want to commend the Prime Minister because I know that he has increased this subvention to most of these um, agencies. Most agencies saw an increase in their subvention from the time that we assumed office. But there is still room for us to do a little more, Mr. Speaker. By investing in training, education and support programs, we can unlock the immense potential of our fellow citizens with disabilities. This is not just a moral imperative. It's a smart investment in our nation's future. Together, we can build a society where everyone can participate, contribute, and reach their full potential. Mr. Speaker, there is a lot more that I can say on the matter of persons with disabilities. But I know soon you will tell me that time is against me, so I will leave the rest for when I engage with the technocrats and the various stakeholders. What I must say, however, is that together we can build a more inclusive and prosperous St. Lucia for all. Mr. Speaker, I now turn to the critical issue of crime and my role in the Ministry of Crime Prevention. There is no denying, Mr. Speaker, there is no denying the worrying rise in gun violence in St. Lucia. The brazenness of these murders is deeply concerning. Citizen security and well-being are at stake, and we must act swiftly to restore some semblance of peace and comfort. We cannot afford to wait. We all, and I mean everyone, including myself, Mr. Speaker, I don't exclude myself, we must develop a zero-tolerance approach towards crime. But before I delve further into the crime situation, I must address the opposition's disgraceful, distasteful, and frankly embarrassing approach to crime. Their sole focus, Mr. Speaker, seems to be the Prime Minister's resignation. During the administration, despite rising homicides, I don't recall calls for the then Prime Minister's resignation. While they criticize, we welcome stakeholder meetings. The Prime Minister, in his deliberation on Tuesday, was right when he emphasized the distinction between enforcement, that is, the police responsibility, and the broader interventions, which is civil society collaboration. And you can see, Mr. Speaker, the stark contrast between the two administrations. And this stark contrast speaks volumes. Recently, I heard the opposition not a week ago, advocating for stakeholder meetings on crime, and I applaud them for that. But what I must say is when these calls are made, we must ensure that we make them with the utmost sincerity, and not just to try to be, um, appear or purport to be something that we're not. The Prime Minister that I know is always open to ideas. In fact, I have been receiving suggestions and proposals from various individuals, both locally and abroad. And once this budget wraps up, Mr. Speaker, my primary focus will be twofold. Launching initiatives to combat the current crime surge and engaging stakeholders in crafting a comprehensive national crime policy. Honesty is paramount. We must acknowledge the roots of this problem. We did not reach this point overnight, nor will the solutions appear by sunrise. 
And we cannot appear to be disillusioned and try to murmur guide people and make them believe that the answer is somewhere in a drawer that you go and open and you just pull it out. That's not how it works, Mr. Speaker. Decades, we are where we are because of decades of neglecting smaller issues, which has metastasized into the crisis we now face. Blame transcends any administration. Responsibility lies in all who govern during this period. Mr. Speaker, crime's complexity demands a comprehensive, all-encompassing approach. We need to delve deeper into the, into the phenomenon of murder in St. Lucia, understanding the motivations behind these acts. We have to spend some time to understand why people do what they do. The age range and the backgrounds of those offenders deserve the utmost scrutiny. Only by understanding the why can we formulate evidence-based policies to address their needs. The burden of crime falls on everyone. When we think of a crime in St. Lucia, murder often dominates the conversation. However, we must address all facets of crime. Petty crimes cannot be ignored, for this very attitude of neglect has fueled the current situation. Many who resort to gun violence did not start there. A history of unaddressed minor offenses emboldened them, and we can no longer adopt the bystander mentality of that's not my business, let them deal with it. I put at my home, I have a wall around my home. We can no longer, Mr. Speaker. Bullets have no name, and I know that the member for um, Vuefort South, Vuefort North, sorry, he remember that saying last night because last night we attended a town hall meeting with CAFA facilitated by the Ministry of Health, and we listened firsthand, Mr. Speaker, to the young men and the young women of this country. And we listened to them and their experiences and their stories and the negative impact that crime has on them. And how can you not feel emotional when a child tells you, Mr. Speaker, that they are forced to stay in class, notwithstanding that they're hearing gunshots on the outside, not knowing where these gunshots are coming from or who is going to eat? How can you not get emotional? How can we play politics with these type of situations? How can we be insensitive to these type of situations? Everyone is affected. Doctors, healthcare professionals, fire service, overburdened police, the teachers, students, the entire economy suffers. Mr. Speaker, my lady that cream see a situation ki complex. Et puis ici a situation ki kai buizen nou servi tout sa nou ni pou nou sa adresse problem krim sa la. Nou ni pou gade se moun an ki ka fè se krim sa la. Kote se moun sa ka sorti. Ki ka li te kai yo ka wete an di dan. Qui l'âge ces mouns là? Est-ce c'est non mais c'est femme? Et puis là nous copain ces bagages là, là nous 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 ni toute information ça là. Nous qu'à dire la position pour nous ça mettez bagages à dire la place pour try mener situation comme ça là en wake. Là nous copain pour qui ça mouns qu'à faire ça y a qu'à faire parce que là ni en raison, là ni en raison. Et puis, nous perdons nou perd à la jeunesse, nou. mais nous still ni un chai pli. Et puis, là, nous plus de monde, cette ci qui ni bon tiers tiers, yo, parce que là, nous qui ni mauvais Et puis, parce que, avec ces convictions, ça la moins, qui ni moins ici à Rodia, qui ni moins qu'à parler de la situation, crime ça la. Crime qui a affecté tout le monde. Et puis, là, nous parlons de crime en cette ci Majorité à ces temps, majorité à ces là, mon cas quoi, là nous parlons about crime en cette ici, that nous juste qu'à parler about ça car crime, murder et bien là mon mort. Mais crime qui a aller plus loin passer ça. 
Et puis nous n'y pouvons adresser ça, nous avons créé ces petits crimes là. Ces petits bagages là, nous n'y pouvons pas passer et pire. Remember, you have 15 minutes left. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ces petits bagages là, là nous quittons yo, et puis nous ne pouvons pas adresser yo. Yo ka tourner un gros bagage. C'est ces petits bagages là, nous n'y pouvons pas adresser pour être pour les dates. Nous ne pouvons pas nous dans la situation de la pour nous pour adresser ces gros bagages. Mr. Speaker, I take crime prevention very seriously. And this government has been actively fighting crime since taking office. We have strengthened legislation and enforcement. We have reviewed and strengthened legislation like the Firearms Act. However, effective policy requires proper enforcement. It is this happening, Mr. Speaker, to see repeat offenders back on the streets shortly after arrest. This weakens, deterrence, and demotivates the police. And I say, Mr. Speaker, that we need a more efficient criminal justice system. Only this morning I read an article where three individuals, I think came out just after 11 this morning, Mr. Speaker, three individuals again got bail for fire-related offenses, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we have police officers who put their life on the line every day. They go out there. We hear the situations. And I'm not saying that somebody should not be given bail, Mr. Speaker. That's what I'm saying. But Mr. Speaker, it is heartbreaking to see. It's a quick check where that who are we tell moon. And people pas même ni deux jours pour arrêter moun sa la. Moun sa la. Et quoi arrêter ou arrêter yo pour un physique ou arrêter yo jeune et puis physique et puis deux jours après yo a vie à sous chemin, yo a vie à sous la, yo a fait plus bagaille toujours. Ou ka mande si ou met corps dedans sous les policiers. Met corps situation police. Ou ka quitter famou derrière. Oui, ou ka pe ou pour faire travail. Mais là ou ka fait primaire ou pe tout ça ou ça fait ou ka fait et puis là ou a pou faire tout ça ou ka wè dat c'est mon pas même ni deux jours mais trois jours yo a vie dehors et puis là ni moun ki a vie dehors et puis yo a vie fait yo a vie chebe et puis physique yo a vie dehors encore et puis ou ka mandé est système justice là est-ce qu'il a travail manière est supposé travail so for that mr speaker i think that we need to strengthen the criminal justice system the prime minister outlined police support initiatives on page 45 of his presentation, I heard the upgrading of police facilities to $2.7 million. And that is crucial in order to create a comfortable working environment. Equipping the police is vital given the escalation in gun violence. And we saw the recent purchase of firearms and ammunition, which is supposed to enhance their capabilities. Additionally, the police receive furniture, they receive equipment, they receive cameras, $5 million worth of vehicles. And as I say vehicles, Mr. Speaker, some claims that these are replacements, not additions. But I say regardless, Mr. Speaker, regardless if it is replacement, this government has provided more resources to the police than any previous administration. But notably, but notably, Mr. Speaker, under the last administration, there were very little to no complaints from the people who were supposed to be the voice of the police, notably. Major repairs for police stations are on the way, including the construction of the Northern Division headquarters. Additionally, a building on the Upper Bridge Street is being retrofitted, and it will have nine holding cells. We see forensic enhancement, forensic lab, including the recent acquisition of a ballistic comparison microscope. We see justice system investment, only last week, Mr. Speaker, I think we um, were just outside this building where we witnessed the sorting ceremony for the new halls of justice, and this signifies commitment to a swift justice project. Moreover, Mr. Speaker, we saw the reinstatement of police training vote, which demonstrates our ongoing support. Additionally, improvements are underway for the bodily correction facilities, and these initiatives combined will significantly impact crime reduction. And we need a well-oiled crime-fighting machine where all parts function harmoniously. Like a car, a faulty gearbox hinders performance. Effective implementation of these measures will greatly assist in our fight against crime. But that's not all, Mr. Speaker. We have only focused on measures to deal with crime and criminality after it has happened. How do we deal with it after it has happened? But a national crime prevention policy must be holistic in nature and must prioritize preventative measures. Data-driven approach. In order to be effective, we need empirical data on the crime situation. We need to collate, and I know that some research has been done, we need to collate all existing data and conduct further studies to identify the areas most in need of addressing. 
Mr. Speaker, we are aware of the importance of social programs in the fight against crime. Programs like Our Boys Matter. These are essential as they provide critical support for youth as, at risk of dropping out of school. And I think over 100 boys will, will beneficiaries from that um, program. There is a need to increase opportunities for economic empowerment, especially for young people. And that is why we set up a youth economy agency. And we've seen close to 600 recipients benefiting from this program. And this demonstrate, what this does, it demonstrates the effectiveness of this approach. But we have to continue expanding training opportunities and fostering partnerships with private sector to create a thriving youth economy. In our attempts, we have to also ensure that education and upskilling happens. And in our attempts to provide more educational opportunities, I know that the Ministry of Education has embarked on TVET program. And this is crucial in providing marketable skills and reducing vulnerability to crime. What this program does, Mr. Speaker, it allows for opportunities beyond academia. And it would seek to address some of the insecurities and some of the feelings of inferiority faced by citizens who are not employable due to their lack of skills, values, and attitudes. Mr. Speaker, I've said all that to say that we are aware of the complex nature of crime. And we are happy to embrace a holistic approach. We have been using a multifaceted approach to deal with this crime phenomena. And I don't think that we should try to reinvent the wheel, but rather we should acknowledge that effective crime prevention and reduction requires multiple stakeholders working at the macro, meso, and micro levels. The national crime prevention policy should take into account the substantive roles that some agencies and organizations already play in this effort. Therefore, while the government will provide leadership for advancing new initiatives and enhancing, exec and enhancing existing interventions by ministries, departments, and agencies, we'll also work collaboratively with non-governmental organizations, the private sector, labor, and I say labor, that is why I brought the issue of the minimum wage reform, Mr. Speaker, and other critical stakeholders to enhance the scale and speed of delivery. The intention is to coordinate and collaborate with all relevant stakeholders, organizations, and individuals to ensure the effective delivery of a national plan. We can no longer afford to implement measures just for implementing measures sick. We need to ensure that the programs, measure and policy that we implement are smart. Mr. Speaker, there is also the need for accountability. The accountability has to be free with, and I think something similar um, happens in Barbados, where the government will be accountable to its citizens for the implementation of agreed strategies for the prevention and reduction of crime. Second, layer of accountability is where the implementing ministries, the agencies and organizations will be accountable to the government, clients and partners for transparent and effective implementation and citizens will be asked to play an active role in preventing and reducing crime through their active engagement and providing feedback to the government. Mr. Speaker, I know my time is near so to close off on the topic of crime today, I will say there needs to be focus on prevention, rehabilitation and enforcement. And just last evening, I attended the town hall meeting facilitated by CAFA with the Minister of Health, and I heard firsthand from the young people of this country, and they highlighted several key areas for expansion, and we are going to give serious consideration to these areas. Divers diversification of the education curriculum, after school enrichment activities, greater parental involvement, strengthening family and community institutions, addressing poverty and wealth disparity, creating safe spaces. And it's not that we are not doing most of these things already, Mr. Speaker but it speaks to the need to expand on some of what it is that we are already doing. We are aware of the challenges, particularly of the porous borders and the illegal firearms. And I think, Mr. Speaker, that we should, although people may think otherwise, I think that we should pursue a firearm amnesty program, but not one where we buy back firearms. I don't support one where we buy back firearms, but one where you bring back your firearms because you know that is the right thing to do. If you have an illegal firearm, you bring it in and you will not be charged and we'll be intensifying police efforts to bring illegal firearm holders to justice. So you will not say that you did not get an opportunity to turn it in. The police have our full support. As long as they operate within the law, the police have our full support. And I know that we'll regain the public trust and work to make St. Lucia a safe place for everyone. A lot more will be said, Mr. Speaker, as it relates to crime in the coming weeks. But let me just take a moment to see how these government policies impact Miku North. First, Mr. Speaker. You have five minutes left. Yes, that's sufficient time, Mr. Speaker. 
First, Mr. Speaker, the Miko Jetty repairs on page 33. I'm thrilled to report that this work is nearing completion and the refurbished washrooms will open next month for our valued fishermen. Several constituents, Mr. Speaker, have benefited from the MSME loan and youth. MSME loans grant facility and also from the youth economy grants and this is a fantastic support this is fantastic support for our local businesses and young entrepreneurs speaking of, of infrastructure although I don't see the member with responsibility for infrastructure here I anticipate that Miku North will be a significant beneficiary this year as it relates to roads the diaspora investment bill Mr. Speaker that the Prime Minister mentioned is something that I eagerly await because I have quite a few constituents who are living in the diaspora and they are ready to invest in their homeland. Mr. Speaker, the cemetery in Monrepo, the works are progressing there beautifully, Mr. Speaker. And I look forward to the start of the works at the Wen Plain Field. I know that this will be happening very soon. Immediately after the Cricket World Cup, we should see some physical activity happening on the ground at the Wen Plain Field. So, Mr. Speaker, those people who said that they would, would not see the jetty, I can tell them that the jetty is there and the jetty has happened at a rate lightning rapidity mr speaker and i want to commend i want to commend the contractors for the work that they've done and notwithstanding the pace at which is done i can tell you that this jet team mr speaker is more solid than that of servants and probably put together that is the quality of the jetty that the fishermen in miku are going to receive mr speaker the patients early childhood center Works are ongoing on the Passius Early Childhood um, Center. And I know that I'm hoping that when, <laughs> I'm hoping that when, the, when, when September comes, that we can see children being enrolled at the Passius Early Childhood Development Center. Mr. Speaker, in closing, I just want to commend the Prime Minister for prioritizing people-centric policies. I thank the fantastic people of Mikud North for their continued support, and I promise them that this year will be truly exciting for our constituency. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.